Hi, I'm Zach Shirley. I'm the president of the Student Veterans Organization here at Finger Lakes Community College. I'm a U.S. Army veteran with seven years in service, and I still serve in the U.S. Army Reserves. We've been hearing a lot about mental health in the news and on social media, so we decided it was time to bring in someone to have a conversation with. And today, we have the opportunity to speak with Ashley Lewis. She is the Vice President of Operations at Family Counseling Services of the Finger Lakes. She has over a decade of experience helping families and individuals deal with mental health and trauma. We had a really good conversation with her today. Hey Ashley, thank you for joining us uh, to talk about a little bit more about mental health and counseling. Uh, would you mind giving us a little bit of your background? Absolutely. So I'm Ashley Lewis. I'm currently the Vice President of Operations for Family Counseling Service of the Finger Lakes. I've been with that organization about seven years. I uh, started there as a trauma therapist supporting individuals impacted by trauma. Uh, I've been in the mental health field for about 12 years now, providing therapy. Oh, cool. Yeah. Zach, would you like to start us off? Or? Yeah, absolutely. You know, thank you uh, for coming. You know, I think this is very important work to do, not only for the community, um, but for individuals as well, you know, especially one on one, like you guys tend to work. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about counseling itself and therapy and uh, some different aspects about that specifically. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess one of the first things I'd like to ask, um, and this might be kind of a, um, a tough question for some people to think about, is how can people tell if they're not responding well um, to therapy that they're getting? So I think when it comes down to what if therapy is not working for you, I guess it depends on what you mean by that. Um, different different treatment is going to take a different amount of time and it really comes down to i think the therapeutic relationship between the client and the therapist and being able to have those conversations um, if you see an increase in symptomology or you know what brought you into therapy feels like it's gotten a lot worse to the point of you know safety concerns then seeking out those additional crisis resources might be important if you're just overall you know, not seeing improvement in the way that you want to, I would be assertive with your therapist and honest and ex express that you're not sure if this is working for you because you're not really getting the results that you were hoping for, which I think will open up a bigger conversation. Sure. And that's something that, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a type of service. Mm -hmm. You know, the client to provider um, yeah. is, is a service. You know, I think people have this expectation that there's going to be some kind of result for them um, but would you say that, um, you know, it's um, sometimes unpacking trauma that took place over a long time, a long span, you know, is that proportional to how long it could take to move past that? Is patience a huge factor when, you know, seeking this kind of help? Yeah, I think that I love what you said there, like unpacking it. So when I think of going to therapy, whether it's because someone's experienced trauma or maybe it's relational conflict, maybe it's adversity, it didn't take a few weeks to get to that place emotionally, right? So there's going to take time to work through that. And sometimes when we get into therapy and start that therapeutic process, we're pulling stuff out that we haven't really talked about in a long time or maybe not ever. And so sometimes I think it could feel overwhelming or almost worse before it feels better because you're identifying those emotional responses. You're identifying that, that stressor that brought you to seeking out therapy in the first place. So when we talk about is therapy working, is it not working, I think that's super relevant. So if if it's not, if they believe that, it's, if someone believes that it's not working for them, mm -hmm. if they did like a few sessions with their therapist, should they, do you think they should take a break from that therapist and come back or should they start over with a new therapist and kind of find a new one? I think that it's different for everyone. It depends on what they're looking for. I would just encourage, um, like I said, that open dialogue between therapist and client because therapeutic work, healing from anything takes time. Before you can do anything in treatment, before you can support treatment goal attainment, you have to first have a therapeutic alliance. You have to have trust um, and safety within the context of that relationship. So depending on what a person's experience, even just building that trust might take some time before you're even getting into maybe the presenting issue or the reason that you sought out uh, treatment in the first place, if that makes sense. 
Gotcha. What do you think are some reasons it might not work for someone? Mm. That's a hard one. <laughs> um, as a therapist, I obviously believe strongly that, that therapy can be beneficial. Um, I've seen it be beneficial, obviously. Uh, but I will say that therapy is not for everybody all the time. Um, there is a lot of research that indicates that timing of therapy matters. So if you have an individual that experienced a difficult situation, maybe an isolated tra trauma or observed a trauma of someone else, but they have a lot of healthy uh, social supports, they have really good relational health, it wouldn't necessarily be beneficial for that person to go into therapy, um, which I think is kind of counter how we kind of market therapy, right? Therapy is good for everybody. I wouldn't disagree with therapy having benefit, obviously, um, but again, it's not, it's not always the right intervention for everybody, depending on what they're going through. Gotcha. I know you said that um, therapy, you believe that therapy isn't for everyone all the time. Yeah. Um, I just want to know because I feel like it would be beneficial to help validate, you know, people out there that have experienced this themselves and where, whereas some might not believe them. Do you believe or have you had any experience with, um, I would say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say bad therapists as in bad people, but therapists that might not be as up to the job? Yeah. So are you asking if I've ever seen that happen? Yes. Yes. So I, throughout my career, I've had a great opportunity to train many therapists, work with many therapists, and work with clients that have worked with other therapists as well. Um, never would I disrespect anyone in the profession. It's a, it's a very worthwhile, meaningful career path, and it's a difficult one. I think in order for a therapist to be the best that they can be, they also have to be significantly supported by their organization and have that ongoing training and support. Um, I would say that not every therapist is for every client and not every client is for every therapist. I think in the helping profession, therapists wanna help people, mm -hmm. right? And so sometimes there might be a misunderstanding of skill set, or uh, maybe misunderstanding what the client need is also, sometimes there's underdeveloped skills. If like you're a newer therapist, if you have unmanageable caseload, if you're working with 100 clients a week, then the quality is gonna be impacted. Um, so then again, the client being able to be honest and assertive with if their needs are being met or not is important and then making different steps if needed. Speaking of needs kind of being met, what do you think somebody, what should be like the more realistic expectations that someone could get out of counseling and therapy and what are some unrealistic ones? That's a really good question. <laughs> you guys got great questions today. I think an unrealistic expectation is that you're gonna go to a session for 50 minutes a week for maybe a couple months and then that will be it. Uh, I think that's unrealistic expectation because what I've, I've said to many clients over the years is uh, a lot of the work is going to happen outside of this session. So, and I think that's so crucial, right? So I can spend 50 minutes with someone once a week and have incredible session, incredible time with that client. If there is no practice of skill or acknowledgement of experience outside of the session, then how much is that really impacting um, the quality of that person's life? So when we're saying like, when I said not everyone is ready for therapy, all the time, or maybe therapy is not right for a person all the time. If a person is not at a place to be able to engage in some of the skills and in the processing, then it might not be beneficial for the individual at that time, if that makes sense. So I have a friend that was is currently seeking therapy and she originally they were already in with a therapist, they had a therapist already. They were having some difficulties with them because the therapist wanted to focus on getting through their trauma and like over it, mm -hmm. whereas they wanted to focus on, the client themselves wanted to focus on processing and figuring out kind of where it came from and delving a little bit more deeper into themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So what you said like, a client accepting the skills that a therapist is providing them. When we 
what I was referencing before is, is the individual at a place to absorb the feedback, to practice skills outside of session? But what I think is extremely important to share is that the client is the expert in their therapeutic experience. They're the expert in what they're needing and what brought them into treatment in the first place. Um, it's called self-determination. So allowing the self, the individual, the client to be in charge of their treatment course is one of the most important factors of therapy, in my opinion, specifically if you are supporting an individual that's experienced trauma. I feel very passionately about this topic. We know that trauma is uh, a loss of sense of safety and a loss of that sense of control over oneself. So then to be in a therapeutic experience in which the therapist is dictating the course of therapy without consent from the client can actually be re-traumatizing. Um, not trying to throw shade at any therapist at all, uh, but I think that it's the most important part in being a therapist is allowing your client to be in the driver's seat and you are just a really great uh, passenger on their journey. You're providing them feedback and information on what you're an expert in which might be therapy, it might be therapeutic modalities, it might be human behavior, but the client themselves is the expert in what they're needing, how fast or how slow treatment should go, and in what direction. No one should be forced to engage in a trauma narrative before they are ready and before they choose to do so. So I wanted to kind of continue a little bit along the lines of that because I feel like this next question might really help a lot of people that are kind of struggling with this right now. Mm -hmm. So what my friend is currently dealing with now after they've left this therapist is the access to therapy and counseling and trying to find that access due to like uh, certain health cares not being accepted and, mm -hmm. and all that. So I was wondering if you had any advice or knowledge on places that they can go to that is either rather relatively low cost or a some kind of website or tool that they can use to find some therapy yeah absolutely so um i know like psychology.com there are there are different things online where you can look and search uh, therapists and their bios and what kind of insurance they accept um, a lot of organizations can also offer like a sliding fee scale to reduce costs so then it's based on like income um, some organizations also have grants that allow the organization to provide services uh, free of charge. So the organization I work with, we have grants like that. Um, so checking in with the different organizations to see if there are grant opportunities, scholarship opportunities, sliding fee scales, um, so that it can mitigate costs for clients. A lot of organizations are also shifting to telehealth to offer more options and more accessibility to mental health services as well. Um, I will say that we've noticed quite a bit in the field that a lot of organizations have wait lists. Uh, there's just not enough therapists. So tell all your friends to go to school to be a therapist. We're hiring. <laughs> uh, we'll take uh, 15 more to meet the needs of the community. You know, um, listening to you two um, talk about that made me think um, a lot of people, you know, I've been tackling like stigmas around um, mental health and seeking counseling. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that especially nowadays, people are hesitant to accept um, advice uh, from healthcare professionals like medical or mental health, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a dissonance between um, how they perceive the professionals' opinions and how they think things should proceed and their own wants and needs as a client, you know? Mm -hmm. And like you said, with Dom's question, um, the client has that right to decide the direction that things go. Mm -hmm. But in your field, is there like a gentle, like a nudge that has to happen to kind of keep the ball rolling to prevent maybe stagnation of, you know, the process? Like a little therapeutic finesse? A little bit, yeah. yeah. Or to guide them in the right direction. You yeah, know, absolutely. To help people out, yeah. I think that's part of the, the skill that the therapist should be trained in practicing. So the, the client's determining what brought them into treatment. They know what's going on in their world and what they're wanting support on. The therapist is trained in different ways to, to meet that need. There's ways to engage in therapeutic conversation and therapeutic dialogue to support the client working through some of those things. 
uh, to meet the client's needs while still having like therapeutic integrity. Um, there's ways to therapeutically challenge thinking or distortions um, as a therapist to a client. That does not, um, that doesn't mean that the, the client's still not in the driver's seat, but the client's there because the therapist is bringing an additional layer of expertise and knowledge. So the goal is to have a therapeutic alliance where you're bringing in both of those things. If you work with a client and you have that rapport and that engagement, you're able to engage in those honest, authentic conversations about what might be good to try, um, different strategies to, to work on, different skills to practice in and outside of therapy. So 100% agree, clients are in the driver's seats. The best therapeutic experience is gonna be one that has a great therapeutic alliance between the therapist and the client. Yeah. Um... You know, it sounds like uh, trust is a point that you hit mm -hmm. and it makes sense, you know, because we're talking about some very sensitive things and very personal things. Mm -hmm. um, trust. Um, you also mentioned that um, um, self-determination was another big key. Mm -hmm. um, what are some things that you do to help give clients that sense of self-determination to empower them that, you know, they can work through this, they have what it takes or you'll help them along? To, to push through these challenges and really get to where they would like to be, if that's their end goal, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I say that. I, I have that conversation. Right from the, the first time that a client walks in my door, I let them know that they're in charge in my office. We're not going to go anywhere um, emotionally that they don't want to they don't want to visit. We're not going to, you know, engage in a process that they're not ready for. Um, right at an intake session, the first time I'm meeting a client, I'll say to them, you have a right to request a different therapist. Not every therapist is right for every client. Not every client is right for every therapist. And empowering them to know they're truly in charge of this experience. We're going to do as much or as little as they're wanting to do. The only things that would like trump that per se is if there was an imminent danger to self or others, obviously. Then there would be different decisions that had to be made. Outside of those things, they're in charge and being able to set that stage for them immediately at the beginning. What I've noticed alleviates some of those nerves of coming into someone else's room who is an expert in something else, you know? Now, in the, in the military realm, um, a big cornerstone of our operations and the lifestyle is roles and responsibilities. Who is responsible mm -hmm. for what? Who does what? And you were talking a bit about uh, intake sessions where you would lay these things bare and say, I'm here for this. I can help you with this. This is my responsibility to you. Yeah. Um, now, on the flip side, as a client, someone that comes in, you know, they're going to have a certain degree of responsibility to themselves mm -hmm. to make sure that they're getting the most out of your help. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say are some things that are really important for um new clients or people that are thinking about uh, seeking counseling, what would really help them get the most out of the process, I guess? Yeah, I think identifying with themselves if they're ready to engage in the process, I think that's really important because like we discussed earlier, therapy is not always the right answer for everyone all the time. Um, so are they ready to be vulnerable and engage in some of that emotional exposure? Um, knowing that about yourself before you seek out therapy is, I would say, important so you know what level you're going to be able to engage in the process. Um, consistency matters. So if, and, and I've worked with so many clients, and there's always a number of reasons why this might happen, life experience, circumstance. Um, but if you come, you know, week one of the month and then I don't see you again until the next month, it's going to be harder to make progress because there's inconsistency in attendance. Um, being able to authentically engage with the therapist and having, um, again, some of that emotional exposure and vulnerability is important so that we can understand and get to the root of what the presenting problem was. And then commitment to the process is important. Uh, committing to yourself, really, for the process. Now, I guess on the obverse, looping back to what we talked about earlier, you said that it's not always right for everybody at every time. Mm -hmm. So if either they <clears throat> don't find that it's working for them personally or they're having either a financial difficulty, scheduling difficulty where they can't, mm -hmm. you know, 
seek that regular help. Um, where can they look elsewhere in their own personal life to seek some support networks, like yeah. identifying other strong support in their community or maybe their family and friends? I think you answered a question really well. Right. Um, I think that it looking into the community, uh, there are support groups as well. So when we're looking at like therapy, we're talking a lot right now about like individual therapy, right? In that context, that's great. Um, there are other supports that are not clinical individual therapy that can be beneficial to an individual. Um, like community groups, so, like I said, support groups, often uh, churches or communities, um, organizations have support groups where people can go and uh, just engage with other people maybe going through a similar experience. Again, it doesn't have to be professionally led to be beneficial. The most important thing is just that authentic, safe, predictable connection with somebody else. So finding that within your family, if possible, is obviously wonderful. That's not possible for everybody. So then building those networks within the communities, um, maybe people that you work with, uh, maybe school affiliated, just finding different ways to connect, different things to be involved in can be very beneficial for mental health. That's interesting that you kind of brought that up because um, I just recently learned that there are some programs out there where it's like, therapy but not like with a therapist it's like you working with horses and you oh, doing yes. um like learning how to garden and like grow like certain foods and certain flowers and stuff like that which i thought was super interesting because it wasn't so like uh, me sitting down with a therapist and kind of just hashing it out uh over like in a span of an hour it was actually like doing hands-on stuff and like kind of um working through and like feeling better just in general by doing kind of certain activities and stuff. So it's kind of like getting out and like going for a hike for some people type yeah. of thing. It's very regulating to the yeah. brain to engage in predictable, consistent, repetitive activity. Mm -hmm. um, so like animal assisted therapy, um, beneficial. There is um, equestrian therapy as well with horses. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different uh, methods that can support healing without an individual having to go into an office, work with a professional, and like share their deepest, darkest secrets, right? Yeah. It's all about connection, it's all about healing. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to do that. You don't have to be a licensed uh, practitioner to be able to support that healing. There's one fear that I've heard and seen from a lot of my friends is what if I go to a therapist and I get admitted um, to mm. a hospital? And that's one of the things that I have seen from a few of my friends and it really deters them from seeking further help because they're scared like, well, I know that I'm not gonna be good going to the hospital. I still have like people I need to take care of, family I need to take care of and all mm -hmm. these other things that like, they're scared that if they were to go to a therapist and kind of open up about the things that are really uh, messing them up on the inside, that they might not see their family for a while. That right. is so real. Mm -hmm. Relevant to that fear of if I go in and I'm really open and I'm really honest, are they going to admit me somewhere? Are they going to think I'm crazy? Yeah. You know, like all that horrible stigma. As a therapist, in 12 years, I've never had to uh, support like a mental health hygiene arrest. I've never had to do any of that. Um, I have had to refer families to a crisis level um, resource because there was concern with danger. The only time that a therapist is going to have to like call like 911 or call um, to have someone admitted someplace, there'd have to be like an imminent danger like imminent danger to self and others. And there's a difference between like ideation and intent. Ideation is, I've thought about these things before. Intent is when I leave here, I have intent to do these things. Um, so that's where like safety assessments are really important. Uh, suicidality, homicide, homicidal ideation or intent, like therapists doing those evaluations can be helpful, but again, it's different to say, I've been feeling so stressed out lately that sometimes I wish I didn't wake up in the morning. That's ideation. Mm -hmm. Like how, how often do people experience these thoughts without intent on acting on them? 
that's very different from someone having a plan to cause harm to themselves or others. Mm -hmm. So that fear is very valid. Um, and if, if you're trying to, you know, support your friend and have that conversation, like looking into resources on, on that topic or looking up the information, when does a therapist have to make that call? What is the likelihood of that being the, the implication or the outcome of, of being honest about your struggles? Because I see that fear a lot too. Mm -hmm. Not quite in that direction, but I think that another fear people have when they start to open up is that they're going to turn the stone over and find more. Mm. I think some people are afraid that they're already afraid of what they feel now. I think they're afraid to open up further with someone professional and then they find more things to add more stress that they didn't know existed. Yeah. Um, is that something that you might have encountered or what would you say to someone that might be afraid of that? You know. Yeah, I've seen that quite a bit in my career. And if we think about the process of like therapy, if we know that phase one is that stabilization and trust building, stabilization is extremely important. It's our ability to stay grounded. And it's that, that acknowledgement of feelings without over-identification of feelings. So when you're in there unpacking stuff that maybe you haven't talked about or thought about, a, a good therapist, a trained therapist is not gonna take you there if that stabilization and that grounding is not there. So for me as a therapist, I'm working on those internal capacities to be able to engage in that processing before I bring a client to a place of unpacking all of that stuff where they then have better capacity to work through it and learn new strategies, new skills um, to, to leave treatment better than when they started. I mean, that's the goal, right? So making sure they have that internal capacity before diving deep in to, to what, whatever it is they're processing. Right. Yeah. So we just can't put the cart before the horse then. It's a process. Absolutely. So it's like kind of trying to return, making sure you can always return your client to baseline. Yes. Mm. That's huge. Mm. That's hugely important in my opinion. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much. You know, this has been a fantastic conversation and we've covered a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. And I think we've talked about a lot of things, um, covered a lot of topics that people might be hesitant about. Um, but hopefully, you know, this can show people that, you know, these are thoughts that many people have and uh, options exist to help you out, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, the different avenues, which, where, uh, which way it can go. So thank you very much again for coming to talk to us. Mm -hmm. This was great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both so much. It's been a pleasure. I really learned a lot from our conversation with Ashley, and I hope you did too. One key takeaway that I had was that one bad experience with a counselor does not mean that counseling isn't for you. Talking about mental health will really help break the stigma. Please keep watching for a list of resources and make sure that you put time aside to have conversations of your own.